Hey, it's Nathan, and today I wanted to go ahead and document a talk that I was invited to give at the 13th Ames Conference on Dynamical Systems, Differential Equations, and Applications. Uh, so when this video comes out, it will be basically right after I give the talk or right after I get off a plane coming back home from giving the talk. Uh, and so the title of this talk is The Partial Derivative of Akimoto's Function with Respect to the Parameter. That's titled the same as the paper that I wrote with my co-authors, Dr. Kiko Kawamura, Toby Mathis, and Mihalas Paisanis. Uh, Toby and Mihalas were two undergraduate researchers that I helped mentor while we were writing uh, this paper. And so the goal of this talk is to do a few things. One, I want to introduce you to some ideas and motivate why we did what we did. I want to talk about Akimoto's functions, and then I want to look at partial derivatives of Akimoto's functions and look at our main theorem and how we sketch that proof out. And then if we have time, because I'm going to try to keep this to the same 20 minutes that I had in person, I want to go over some future directions that we are sort of thinking about without going into too much detail. Um, again, I'm going to try to keep this to 20 minutes because that's how much time I had in person. So as we're going through this, the thing that I want you to think about, if you don't know anything else, is I want you to think about flipping a coin. And so depending on how that coin is weighted on each side, uh, that coin gives you a particular probability measure. For every value in the unit interval, there's some probability measure on the full two shift induced by setting the measure of the zero cylinder to A and the measure of the one cylinder to one minus A. Now I went from cylinders to coins pretty fast. So if you're still on the coin land, uh, having a point in the zero cylinder or having a zero first in your point is the same as having a heads result first in your infinite list of coin flip results. And being in the one cylinder or having a one first in your symbolic point is the same as having a tails first in your infinite list of coin flip results. And throughout this talk, I'm going to ask you to sort of go back and forth between the symbolic representation of points in the unit interval and the unit interval quite interchangeably. And so just to make that a little bit more friendly, uh, I just wanted to go really quickly over that there are binary expansions and there are denary expansions, um, right? So for any symbolic point in the full two shift, we have an, we essentially just have an infinite list of results and we can map that onto the unit interval using a binary expansion map, uh, which is the, the natural binary expansion that we, you would use when expanding a decimal in base two, uh, right? And you can do this for any D. So you, there's an appropriate D nary map uh, and we'll move up to uh, D equals three when we need to. Um, and the core of our project is that we wanted to sort of like, we're studying really how these probability measures change with the parameter. Uh, and in particular, the example function that is helpful when thinking about this is Lebesgue singular function, right? So Lebesgue singular function gives you a visual for each of these probability measures uh, for a particular input. It measures the set of all of the symbolic points which have binary expansion that are less than or equal to the binary expansion of your input. Uh, this is the same thing if you're thinking about points on the unit interval as the cumulative distribution function for that probability distribution induced by that probability measure, mu a. Uh, and if we're looking at all of them all at once and we're thinking about things in the unit interval, really what we're looking at is we're looking at the surface. So there, here's some renders of the Lebesgue singular function surface that I was able to code up for this talk. And if you're looking at them, you kind of see that there's some jaggedness to it. And you, we want to sort of understand local properties because we're doing something with a derivative, right? So we want to look at some local properties as we move the parameter slice of the plane uh, of, I'm sorry, of the surface around. So you take some parameter plane and you cut it at a particular, uh, using a particular parameter value and you slide that parameter plane around and we want to study how things are changing locally on the surface with respect to that parameter. So because we want to understand local properties of this surface, we also need to understand how to generate the function that comes from just one of these parameter values, and that was done by Durham in 1957. So given some parameter value that's not one half, uh, the Lebesgue, uh, Lebesgue singular function is a new continuous solution of the functional equation here. And so here, sigma is going to be the full shift, uh, the shift map on the full two shift, and we use repeating ones in place of terminating ones to make sure that this is well defined. Now, the geometric interpretation of this theorem is that you can go ahead and generate 
one of these slices in the following geometric way. So what we do is we start with the unit square, and then we take whatever our parameter value was, and so from that we get an A and we get a 1 minus A, and we go ahead and take the unit square and we scale it down into two different rectangles, one that was scaled vertically by A and one that was scaled vertically by 1 minus A, and we, and we organize them in the unit square in the, that following way, which is shown, if I can point over, way over there, the middle image. Uh, and we keep repeating this process forever and ever with the resulting things. And so the things that stay in the construction at each level are marked with an L. And as we do this infinitely many times and we intersect all of those down, we end up getting these graphs for different parameter values. So the green values are parameter values close to zero and the red and orange rust color values are values that are close to one. And here are some examples of those instances of Lebesgue singular function pictured here. Now, again, we wanna know how this thing changes as we slide the parameter plane around locally. So, we should look at a nice value of a. And well, the nicest value of a was a equals one half because that's what gave us the identity function. And, Taka and sorry, not Takagi, but Hata and Yamaguchi in 1984 found that there's a very close connection between uh, what's happening between this, this sort of trivial uh, case of Lebesgue singular function, a equals one half, and a famous fractal. Right? Uh, or, or if you're used to more of a Western interpretation of the fractal geometry happening here, this blancmange curve. Uh, and so we know a lot of things about Takagi's nowhere differentiable function, uh, and it gives us really nice uh, just correspondence between something that's happening with Lebesgue singular function locally and uh, this other fractal that's also famous in its own right. Uh, so we know all these things about Takagi's knower differentiable function, right? We know it's knower differentiable. We know things about its infinite derivatives. We know that it's self-affine. We know that it attains its maximum at a really large number of points. Uh, we know it's Hausdorff dimension. And there's also a complete characterization of the infinite derivatives of Takagi's nowhere differentiable function. And because we have this sort of roadmap of analysis of how we can study the partial derivative of these parameterized family of functions, uh, like Lebesgue singular function, we can go ahead and ask the question, well, could we analyze a similar family of function at similarly special values? And that's what we did. So I want to introduce that family of functions. I'm going to use the functional equation definition instead of what Akimoto originally used as his definition in 2005. Uh, so for a particular a value between 0 and 1, not inclusive, uh, Akimoto's function satisfies this functional equation, where uh, now we're working with the ternary expansion map, and instead of repeating ones, we use repeating twos instead of a terminating instead of a terminating one. So there, this lends itself in the same way that Durham's uh, result lends itself to a geometric construction. However, I want to introduce that slightly differently. So for each, oh my gosh, oh okay, so. For a within 0, 1, we can go ahead and form the nth level of this geometric construction by instead of using rectangles, we can use a lexicographic ordering on the symbolic interpretation of the x coordinates on this particular set. So we always include 1, 1, and then we look at the words of length n in the full 3 shift. So for example, right, in the first level, our words of length 1 are 0, 1, and 2. So the symbolic points are 0 repeating, 1, 0 repeating, 2, 0 repeating, and then 2 repeating, which corresponds to 1. And so those are ordered uh, 0 repeating, 1, 0 repeating, 2, 0 repeating, and then 2 repeating. And we figure out where Akimoto's function via this functional equation sends those points. So it'll send 0 to 0, 1 third to a, 2 thirds to 1 minus a, and then 1 to 1. And then we connect those points according to that lexicographical ordering on the x-coordinates symbolic representation um, using a line chart. And we, as we do that for longer and longer finite words in the language of the full three shift, uh, we limit out to this function, which um, 
Yes. Uh, so we also are studying a surface here, right? So we have a parameter. We can think about it as a fractal surface like we did with Lebesgue singular function. And what's really cool about Apollonius function is that it generalizes all of these special types of fractals in some sense, right? So where a equals one half, we get Cantor's double staircase, that a equals two thirds and a equals five sixths. And I always get these mixed up. So you get Perkins and Burabaki's function, uh, respectively or irrespectively. I just, I forget which order they're in every single time I talk about this stuff. Uh, and then also we note that at one third, we get that special value where we want to do the analogous analysis on Akimoto's functions that was done on Lebesgue singular function. So we know a lot of things about Akimoto's functions, right? So it's continuous and onto, we're going to view it as a self map of the unit interval. Um, it's self affine and we know it's box dimension for certain parameter values. It's singular for a less than or equal to one half and a not equal to one third. Uh, we have its special value that we care about, and it's of unbounded variation for a greater than equal, to, uh, or rather greater than one half. And then we have this theorem about nowhere differentiability properties. So we have for a not equal to this unique solution to this cubic that appears to come out of nowhere in the unit interval. Um, we get all these nowhere differentiability results. And so this cubic actually comes from the products of the slopes that are used in the functional equation. And there's some like normal C motivation for why one would be a critical value of this cubic uh, that I don't really want to get into. But um, that's a thing. So we know we know a lot of stuff about this. And well, we can sort of make an analogous definition to what was happening with Lebesgue singular function at a equals one half, we can do that for a equals one third. So that's what we define this k of x function to be. So we had some questions, right? Can we graph k of x? Is there a simpler expression for k of x? And for what values is k of x differentiable? And so we actually answered the simpler expression uh, question first, right? So we got this infinite sum representation in terms of this just essentially a ternary shift map, uh, but expressed as in terms of points in the unit interval. And we extended that to the whole real line in a systematic way, because that will be helpful later. And using this, we could do this geometric construction where for n equals zero, you get this graph, and then you get this one and this one and this one. And you do that forever, and you end up getting what k of x looks like, essentially. Right? Uh, and it has this sort of like fractally sinusoidal sort of shape, even though it's nothing like that. So using our expression for k of x, we went ahead and proved that k of x is continuous but does not possess a finite derivative at any point. And so the next question then following that roadmap was to say, see where does it have infinite derivatives and can we classify them all? And we were able to classify them. So if we go ahead and let i1 um, of n be the number of ones in the first n symbols of the symbolic uh, of a symbolic point in the full three shift, then we can go ahead and classify the infinite derivatives in terms of uh, how that particular point in the symbolic space, uh, it's uh, or how its uh, distribution of ones looks asymptotically. Uh, as a corresponding result to this, you can also talk about this in terms of the frequency, uh, the free, uh, the asymptotic frequency of ones in that particular symbolic point. And we can go ahead and say, when is it positive and when is it negative quite quickly as well? Um, right, and so the key thing here is that k is a partial derivative, but when we're talking about k prime, we're talking about the derivative uh, of this partial derivative, right? So the other thing that's really cool about this is that while doing this, we found a, another example of a set that has Lebesgue measure zero while it has Hausdorff dimension one. And this used results about random walks in order to get there. Um, so if we look at the set of all points that have positive or negative infinite derivative, then uh, that Lebesgue measure of that set is zero while the Hausdorff dimension of it is one. So I wanted to go ahead and tell you how we went ahead and classified all of these infinite derivatives, right? Or at least give you a sketch of that argument and sort of convince you that this was a good project for undergrads. 
And what you do is you go ahead and tell your undergrads that we're working with derivatives. We're going to do some calculus. It's just don't use any of the formulas that you learned in that class. Just use the definitions because things are really spiky and things might not work out the way you want to. So we did have to take those definitions in a, a with a with a grain of systematic approach, right? So we go in ahead and look at this H uh, values where you're so somewhere far enough out in the ternary expansion, uh, and we let P be by definition just the place where that H falls in between those two uh, like decimal places of that ternary expansion. Right, and so then we can go ahead and look at the right-hand derivative of k of x by just doing a normal limit difference co quotient style thing, and we can express that using our simpler expression. Um, and what we did is, well, we didn't want to look at that ugly sum all the time, so we defined these dn of xh's, right? And so this turns out to be quite easy to interpret, right? It's just some slope of a secant line connecting these points and you can think about these points as being on the first iteration of our k of x construction as you've extended it to all of the real line uh, and that's really helpful and that's probably that picture is not great for in-person talk but it should be fine for this talk uh, but what's really cool about that is that we can go ahead and then translate that information about slopes of secant lines on this first iteration and the construction of k of x with determining the number of times each one of those slopes occur at, after the first p minus one ternary digits of x. And so through some analysis, right, we can go ahead and look at what happens, um, what happens in those p minus one first digits. And then for everything else, we can go ahead and bound it by this plus or minus 18 using some geometric sum. Uh, so as h goes to zero from the right, p goes to infinity. And so it follows that the right hand derivative is plus or minus infinity if and only if this counting slopes thing goes to plus or minus infinity as n goes to infinity. Now, symmetry, was super key here. And it, it's a really, really helpful property when we were going through and doing this argument because the left-hand derivative kind of eluded us for a little bit. And what we were able to show was that k of x has this weird symmetry thing. Um, so k of x is equal to minus k of one minus x for all x within the real numbers when after you've extended k in uh, by extension of extending phi, that function that we used to easily express k. Uh, and so when we go ahead and look at the left-hand derivative, that's the same as the right-hand derivative of 1 minus x. So we get essentially just an immediate result, right? So if fx and uh, the slopes that you counted for n uh, go to plus or minus infinity, then the slopes that you counted for, uh, sorry, if the slopes that you counted for x go to plus or minus infinity, then the slopes that you counted for 1 minus x will go to plus or minus infinity as n goes to infinity, because this uh, ternary conjugation, that's what that 1 minus x is. You're, you're switching all of your zeros and twos, and the ones stay the same, but zero and two is associated with the same slope, so you're going to be counting the same things. So therefore, we have that the left-hand derivative goes to plus or minus infinity, in the same way as how the right-hand derivative goes to plus or minus infinity, and that completes the sketch of the proof. So, um, cool, we did this thing for one special value, and so the immediate next question is, well, well, let's look at all of them, right? Let's do it with, look at all the things, let's look at all of them, and see if we can get beyond this limiting belief of we should look at the identity, right? So we go ahead and define uh, m a of x equal to this partial derivative, right? And this gives you another surface to look at and uh, it has an expression. We've already shown uh, in some other stuff that we're working on right now that m a of x has an expression as, su as a sum in terms of f, uh, uh, oh, sorry, let me say this one more time. So we've already shown that m a of x has an expression in terms of some, uh, in terms of the Akimoto's function, f a of x, dependent on the ternary expansion of x, which is great. And so we can go ahead and start to generate these slices 
uh, and start thinking about them. And that's what we're currently thinking about. So for a equals one half, for example, we get all these Cantor double staircase functions that are like nested in this one uh, m one half x function, which is the center image. And then also as a gets really, really close to one, we get this sort of like mold growth that happens, or at least that's how I think about it. It kind of looks like me like mold growing. Um, and we get this like blow up sort of behavior that's occurring. Uh, and we want to look at density information of those things, but uh, we're still working on that. And because I'm at 20 minutes, uh, this is where I'm going to go ahead and just say, well, that's that's the talk. I appreciate you hanging out till the end. Uh, I, these are the, the folks that helped along the way for giving us some, uh, some insights as we were working through some stuff. And um, there's a whole list of resources that we used. So, uh, and that's, that's it for this little documentation of this academic talk that I was invited to give. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that's where I'll cut it. Again, appreciate you hanging out. Uh, and if you did show up to my in-person talk and are seeing this on the internet, cool. I'm glad that you revisited this. Uh, there are uh, animations on my website for a lot of the things that came up in this talk. I think I will edit in some of them. So you probably, if I did edit them in, then they will be... <laughs> in the video, but all of the animations that either occurred or lacked in this video are also available on my website. Uh, and I will link to the particular web page where those animations live. And there's a little bit of exposition on there as well to just talk about certain things, but not uh, it's not as intense as what I talked about in this talk. Um, but yes, as always, I'm Nathan. This was just a documentation of a talk that I gave. Uh, I hope you enjoy it again, uh, and I will just go ahead and stop the recording now.